there's nothing so more beautiful than being in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of these days, we're going to be able to cast our crowns at his feet and lift up the mighty God that he is to the glory of the Father. Praise be to the Lamb. But right here and now, we can praise him and worship him and magnify his name before all the world. Amen. They desperately need Jesus Christ. They desperately need the Savior. They desperately need bondages broken. They need hope. And we have the only hope there is in the world. That hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. One more time.
their gods. He warned them of being unequally yoked with unbelieving women who would, in, who would no doubt lead them astray. In summary, he instructed them in the ways of the Lord, reiterating what to do and what not to do to stay in perfect union with God. So one of his chief instructions was found in verse 7 of chapter 23 of the book of Joshua. And it reads, That you may not mix with these nations that remain among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. Now this was very important, because as we will see later, they will have forsaken God, and done exactly as Joshua warned them against, turning to popular opinion, you know, go with the flow, do what everyone else is doing. And that was the worship of idols, participating in other nations' traditions and celebrations. And they would have forsaken their relationship with God. So in verse 8 of chapter 23, then Joshua gives, this, gives emphatic instruction and a very strong warning to the people, saying, but cling to the Lord your God as you have done this day. Now, I am very well aware that we are not Israel, but we have been grafted into the vine through Jesus Christ. And we are now partakers of all that God had for the Jewish people because we are now his people too. And I think that these instructions that Joshua gave the people of Israel apply, as do many, many others to us today, as believers in Jehovah God and Jesus Christ, his beloved son. See, God has not replaced Israel with the church, as some denominations say, and thereby promote anti-Semitism. No, on the contrary, God has grafted us into that great vine of Israel. And I like what Joshua goes on to say in Joshua 24. And I want to uh, go and follow along. And uh, it says, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders of Israel and their heads, their judges, and their officers. I want you to pay attention to that. Their heads, their judges, and their officers were summoned. They presented themselves before God. So these were the leaders of the nation who presented themselves before God. And then it goes on to say, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt in olden times beyond the Euphrates River including Torah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from, be from beyond the Euphrates River and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his offspring. I gave him Isaac. Now he goes on to uh, recount all the miraculous taking of the enemy lands that were, in truth, impossible for them to conquer. And then in verse 12, he says this. He says, I sent the hornet. I sent the hornet. Maybe I didn't type that one in there. I sent the hornet before you, which drove the two kings of the Amorites out before you. But it was not by your sword or by your bow. Now, I love that scripture. All right. So this was a phenomenal example of a supernatural working of the Lord and how we can depend on him when the circumstances tell us otherwise. Yes, amen. Because he used hornets to drive out a whole nation of people. Yeah. All right. You know what? He can do the same for you. Yeah. He, it is unbelievable the, the ways, the miraculous ways that he works. 
And then, then, and then in verse 14, God through Joshua spoke these words. And I hope I have it there. Yes. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But I want us to pay really close attention to this next verse, verse 15. I don't have that one. Y'all have that one? Okay. We had a little trouble this morning. Of course, I was the one who was operating it, so that's probably the reason we're having trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so listen closely. This is uh, verse 15. And if it seems evil to you, if it seems evil to you, serve to if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord now this is so power packed it's really amazing when you really think about and meditate on this scripture. See, Joshua was laying out a case, like in a court, like in a courtroom, that God is truth, and the gods of the Amorites, of which land the Israelites were dwelling in, were false. And but I found this so interesting that Joshua does not demand even to these people that were called by God, these are God's people, he doesn't demand that they choose to serve God, but rather he lays out a very strong argument, a case for truth. And then he says, you choose. Yes. So let's read that in verse 15 again. So you have to listen to it. And if it seems evil to you, to serve the Lord. Choose for, you, for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua laid out this case and strongly persuaded, but he, know, but he knows ultimately that it is still their choice. So Jesus gives the disciples essentially the same farewell address in Luke chapter 9, 22. And he begins to tell early on his disciples of his demise. And we'll see if we have this one. In verse 23, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. I don't have that. No? Mm -mm. Well, I don't know what happened. Next two. Don't let me do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it says, if any person wills to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So what is Jesus telling them? He's telling them, you choose. All right, and then he goes on to tell them what will happen if they don't choose correctly, and that's in verse 24. But just prior to the crucifixion, as Jesus was traveling through Jerusalem, several came to him wanting to join his party. That's what the Bible says, meaning his political party. And, and, in, and Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, says something that we all need to take to heart and which has applied to all that we have read so far. So, in fact, Jesus said to a man who wanted to join him, but first the man asked if he could go say goodbye to his family. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So in other words, if you are going to be in Jesus' political party, if you will, if you are going to be a part of the family of God, then you cannot start out and then long for what you have left behind. Right. Because you will be required to change your lifestyle, your opinions, your everything. So, we all have these instructions from the Old Covenant, and now we have them from Jesus' very own mouth. 
We have directions. We have instructions for living for him. And it all comes down to your choice. It comes down to going forward and never looking back. It comes down to realizing that you are not of this world and much of it you are going to have to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. You're going to have to adapt your beliefs, your opinions, your lifestyle to him and not him to you. Amen. See, in Romans, the last chapter, chapter 16, Paul is writing and he's giving instructions and warning. And in verses 19 through 20, he says this. For while your loyalty and obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, I would have you well-versed and wise as to what is good and innocent and guileless as to what is evil. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. See, what Paul was saying was, Paul was saying, hey, he, he didn't want his friends and his fellow believers to beguile, be beguiled by false doctrine or, or by people who are simply out to cause trouble. So he tells them that he knows they are well-versed and wise. He says they are innocent and guileless in the knowledge of evil things. Now, how many of us could say that today, that we are guileless and uh, we are innocent about evil? Well, I, for one, think I have been exposed to way too much evil than, than I would like to be. But see, he was saying that they are closely following the Lord, and Paul is giving them encouragement. And that Satan, that old dragon, will soon be put under their feet. That's what he was telling them. So my question to you today is, in all that I have described and read from the Word so far, can you honestly say, that that is you, that Paul was just talking about. Or like Joshua, have you decided to follow Christ? Have you, like Jesus, decided to lay down or lay aside yourself, your desires, your wants, your opinions, your very existence, to side, if you will, with Jesus, political party, like Paul, have you determined to be innocent and guileless in, in, in evil things? Are you choosing to lead your family in the ways of the Lord? Or are there areas that are still in darkness where Satan has not been put under your feet? Are you living a life of religion and self-made opinions and rules that are not based on the truth of the word? Are you reading the word to support your own opinions and lifestyles, twisting them to mean something other than the original intent? Are you following the crowd and like dumb sheep, simply going the way of the herd? See, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Why should not the dispensation of the Spirit be attended with much greater and more splendid glory? Now that may seem a little wordy, but what it's saying is that the Christian life is a life lived in the Spirit. And from your born-again Spirit, in Christ's Spirit, filled with His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and I like the way the Amplified says it in verse 8, in explanation, it says, This spiritual ministry, whose task it is to cause men to obtain and be governed by the Holy Spirit. So that's what, that's what Paul was saying. He was saying we are to choose. We are to make a decision to follow and then be led, not in self-sufficiency, but in total surrender to the Master, the Lord Jesus, through the spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit, whose task it is to cause me and you to obtain right everything in order to live a righteous life before God, which we will soon be held accountable. So 
So 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's emancipation from bondage. There is freedom. So I'm sure you get the point of my message today. But let me further lay out my case with dire warning. See, the Bible, which is God's thoughts, his character laid out on display, is being once again attacked, even in mainstream denominations, as these churches go the way of the world, popular opinion, and in many cases, following and pushing modern subcultures. Last week, the Pope came out in favor of homosexual marriage to the shock of many Catholics, I'm sure. The Catholic religion has never in its history supported same-sex anything. Our very Constitution of the beloved United States, the only nation in the history of the world besides Israel of old to have such freedoms that we have enjoyed, which are based on the word and the instructions that God gave to Israel when it was in its infancy. The Constitution is a set of laws that all laws are passed by Congress are run through. The problem today is that our leaders and judges are imposing their own opinions, which we are all tempted to do, and permitting laws and rulings to come from popular whim versus the basis of the written word of which our country was founded upon, and that is the Constitution. But are we not doing this very same thing as Christians where the Bible is concerned? See, you may not like the fact that the Bible calls things right and wrong, and the way that people are justifying their mere moral actions as to say, well, the church has just read it wrong. The church has read it incorrectly. That's not what it really means. So what we're doing is we are rewriting the Bible to suit our own whims and our own opinions. Many of our modern day versions are simply man's interpretation void of the leading of the spirit. The same is being done with the Constitution. And before long, the Constitution, as well as the Bible, as Satan would have it, will both become meaningless pieces of paper that have no bearing on anyone's lives. For just as the word tells us in the latter days, evil will be called good, and good will be called evil. And that's in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. So I listened to some of Judge Amy Coney Barrett's hearing, and as many of the Democratic senators grilled her on her beliefs, trying to make her state how she would vote in a particular case. But she refused on every account to do so, stating that her opinions mattered very little. Rather, the juncture of the law brought before her is what matters. Well, this made me think. Do I want justices that form their own baseless opinions or are moved by popular thought, even if those opinions and popular thought line up with my own? Do I want justices that rule based on the law entrusted in the Constitution, even if those rulings may inconvenience me and my thinking and my opinion? I read an interesting article about a man named John Marshall that I hope everyone will recognize the speech that he gave eulogizing our first president, George Washington. He said, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. He was a self-taught man from a cabin in the deep woods of Virginia. He had one year of formal education under his belt, serving with his father in the Revolutionary War in 1776, where he came to know George Washington. John Marshall became a fierce advocate for the new Constitution, where he eventually became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, a position he held for 34 years. He is known as the father of judicial review when overruling a portion of law passed by Congress. So what exactly is judicial review? Well, the best known power of the Supreme Court is called judicial review, or the ability of the court 
to declare a legislative or executive act in violation of the Constitution. So in other words, it's an overruling of a portion of law that was passed by Congress by running it through the filter of the Constitution and finding it to be in support of the Constitution or finding it to be unconstitutional. So re judicial review is not found within the text of the Constitution itself. See, the court made this determination in the case of Marburg versus Madison in 1803. And in this case, the court had to decide whether an act of Congress or the Constitution was the supreme law of the land, thereby instituting what is now called judicial review. So as in the case of Judge Amy Coney Barrett, see, she met all the modern requirements or the, the she met all the requirements of modern and public opinion. She's a woman, the seemingly gender of choice, which seems to be being thrown out the window as well, because you know today it's uh, transgender, no gender, right? So the women thing is kind of being thrown out the door. But for right now, that was a plus for her that she was a woman. And uh, women still are the preferred gender of choice in politics right now, but I'm sure that's gonna change. She's married to a man, which I'm sure is a strike against her, but they did go above and beyond, and they adopted children of a different ethnicity, not their own, and further, they astounded society by adopting a known special needs child. Now, this is all very admirable, and I will tell you she is sure more woman than I could ever be, because for one, I do not desire or have the guts to pursue that exceptional life, so I do commend her. She is religious, which some of the opposing party vehemently hate, and I'm sure Muslim would have been a more welcomed religion, or perhaps atheism would be. And I am not thrilled with her interpretation of scripture and feel in that area that she is misled. But herein lies my point. No politician, no judge, no president can meet every person's requirement for gender, race, and religion, nor should they. See, we need politicians, presidents, and judges that will adhere to one moral standard, one truth, one set of laws, and that is the basis of this nation laid out in the Constitution of the United States. Opinions, religious beliefs, nor anything else should be read into the law of the land, for when the Constitution is open to the personal judicial, judicial review of one's own self, we as a nation will fall like a house of cards. So what's my point? My point is truth must be based on something. The United States will not last and it will fall just like ancient Rome and countless others if we rule ourselves based on nothing but ever-changing opinions and whims. It so saddens me to hear people my age and older changing their long-held opinions, their sexual God-given orientation and gender, and embrace ways that are contrary to God. Today, no matter the age group, truth has been flung from the proverbial window, and to each his own has replaced the word, and very soon, the Constitution. We've had a good run, but time never stops, and the clock is still ticking. I urge you today, today is the day to make a decision that you are going to establish your beliefs, your opinions, your way of life, the way that you deal with your children, no longer on opinion, and others' experiences, but on the truth which is laid out in Scripture and stamped such by Almighty God Himself. Yes. See, the world is filled with religion. 
Religion is nothing more than one man's opinion of the way things ought to be imposed on others, as we see so clearly in the Middle East. <clears throat> the writings of one man that Satan inspired and endorsed have caused untold misery and death to millions over a thousand years and is still going strong. The United States, rather, was founded on the freedom from religion and which I agree and hope continues. As we see in the farewell address by Joshua that we read earlier, and I think it bears repeating, so we're gonna read it again in Joshua 10, 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is our first recorded case of the right to choose your own personal beliefs, but strongly encouraged to choose the right side and that is to heed the words of the Lord God. See, you cannot afford to jeopardize your soul and the souls of your children by the sway of popular belief. Nor can the United States survive by rotating the Supreme Court, packing the court, thereby picking justices that one can easily predict their future rulings by their religious background, chosen gender, or contemporary opinions. No, God said in Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. See, if you want to live the good life, you will heed those words yeah. in Joshua. If you want to make heaven your home, you will resist the temptation to replace them by popular opinion. If you want to call, if you want God to call you friend, then you will seek to know him not through your own understanding, but through the infilling and the leading of the Holy Spirit the third member of the Godhead. Opinions are flying around like the wind as political sides are now being chosen. But in which party, which person does the truth lie? See, I won't venture to go there because I think that all of us are on the same page when it comes to Tuesday. But see, when it comes to religion and denomination, there is even more serious business at stake. Mohammed got a word from Allah. He saw visions. So should we take at face value a word we may receive or a vision that we may have? No, for the word makes it clear that just as we are to rely on the Supreme Court and their judicial review combing the Constitution for truth, we must run all visions, all words, meaning words we receive from God, through the judicial review of the Word of God. Yes, Our opinions may be found to have no basis in truth. And our perceived words received and visions may be found to be of another source, a demonic source, if you will. See, apart from the Holy Spirit, we too will be tempted and even encouraged to read the word through our own understanding, applying modern thought, modern philosophy, popular opinion, personal experiences, or the experiences of others, to the sacred text, thereby being led away captive by the enemies of our souls. No judicial review, if you will, a surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and his written word, a yielding of your will, your person, 
your spirit to his leading and his perfect knowledge of the truth. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting. Because he who doubts is like a wave on the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. James 1, 5. As we face political upheaval and perilous times, just as the Bible warns, let us pray for wisdom and walk in the truth, the truth of the living word and the truth found in Jesus Christ as our Savior. But I venture to say, without the infilling and the leading of the Holy Spirit in baptism, the proper judicious Re judicial review will not be implemented, and you may find yourself lacking in wisdom and double-minded in all your ways, being tossed about like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind of your feelings, your vain imaginations, and possibly, worse yet, popular opinion. If you want to see this nation survive and thrive, a home of freedom for your children and your grandchildren, you will vote, not for your pocketbook, not your opinions, but you will vote for the preservation of the Constitution as it was given and the excellence of its intent. No, there is no room for opinions in God's economy, only his opinion. And I pray today, you will, from this day forward, lay yours at his feet and pick up his. For just as in Joshua's day, God is giving all of us a mandate. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and Jeff, we have chosen to serve the Lord. Amen. And I pray that every one of you will make the right decision on Tuesday and save our nation, preserve our Constitution, and save our religious freedom because it's at stake. Mm -hmm. It's your right to choose. So choose correctly. And that's all I have. Bless you. same whether you're going to live free from sin, the bondage of sin. It's the same principle there. Mm -hmm. You see, they would only have political freedom as long as they had the freedom to be what God wanted them to be and to follow him. We're in the shape we are today in this nation because this right here quit preaching the truth, mm -hmm. the pulpit. If the pulpits of America had burned hotly for Jesus Christ, we still have a country that was honoring the Lord. Amen? It's just a fact. I lay all this at the blame of the pulpits of America. We became political in the sense of whether it fit our needs, not whether it was right or wrong. You see, God doesn't dwell in the gray area. Right is right and wrong is wrong, and his standard has not changed problem is we have changed our standards to being something different and apart from God's standards. 
but as a small church here, as a growing church, you and I, as far as as long as I'm standing here as pastor, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Despite what a denomination does, despite what other churches do, we are going to follow the Lord. Amen. Amen. I just also want you to remember um, Debbie and Richie. Debbie was in an accident, and uh, she's okay, but she's banged up. And uh, just remember them and remember Joanne, and they're getting better, and everybody will be back here next week. I counted eight of us that are only here that are out. So take up your civic duty and go vote if you haven't already. Let's end with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just lift up the name of Jesus. We lift him up and worship him, and we worship you, Father. And we give you all glory and honor. Lead us by your spirit, and let us open our hearts up and our minds to the leading and the following of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just give you all the glory and honor in Christ's lovely name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.